Welcome to The Hot Dish, comfort food for rural America. I'm Heidi Heitkamp, and with me is my brother, Joel Heitkamp. Let's just admit why there's that bounce in your voice, why you just seem so happy that, you know what, somebody could dent your car and you wouldn't care. (laughs) Just tell them and get it over with. Are we going to talk about, you know, how I have the world's most beautiful grandbaby? Are we going to talk about that? Well, I think that's well within your rights there, Grandma. Uh, Heidi is a brand new grandmother, first grandchild ever, and it's a little boy that already has baseball in his mind. Yeah. You you can see it. (laughs) Most important thing is he has red hair. So congratulations, Well, I mean, what's what's so interesting is Joel is the youngest. Yes, I know that's hard to believe if if you've seen pictures of all of us, but he is the youngest of the clan, but has the most, um, some of the first grandbabies. In fact, uh, was Tenley the first great? Joe, Joe, Julie, yeah, Julie. Julie. But yeah. but you know, my sisters, me and Thomasine, have been borrowing grandchildren for about the last fourteen years, fifteen years, and and uh, Thomasine in particular has created such a bond with Joel's granddaughters. It's just been a joy for us. But we are both of us so excited to um, welcome an, another group of grandchildren. Her grandbaby Petra and my grandson Ashby are going to be carrying the the toddler and kid load as Joel's grandchildren move into teenage years, and that'll be fun. We're going to start this episode by hearing from a lovely couple in Alabama who tragically lost a son to drug addiction, but established a foundation in his name to help men recovering from addiction restart their lives. They'll tell us about their work and the challenges that proliferation of fentanyl is creating for first responders and drug treatment. Will was our third child, grew up in a suburban home in beautiful Alabama. Did really well through school until he hit middle school and hit those golden years of puberty and pressures and all the things that come along with that. He bought a pill in middle school and was suspended from that. From that point on, he really started his struggle. So he was in and out of doing well, staying away from drugs, and then would go right back to the point where we had him in and out of rehabs from Alabama all the way to California. Fortunately, he would do well in rehab, but then would would always relapse once he got back home. So we lost Will in 2012, and he was 25, and we knew that we wanted to do something to honor his name and to try to remove the stigma on you know, this this can happen in any suburb. It's, it's not just in big cities or rural. It can happen anywhere. So we started the Wilbright Foundation, and we wanted to focus on the area where Will struggled the most, which was that next step after recovery. So our foundation is named the Wilbright Foundation, and our facility that we have in rural West Alabama is Restoration Springs. And there's where we house men coming out of recovery but needing help with that next step in life, get a a job, get their driver's license back, housing, transportation, all the things that really hold them back from taking that next step in life. So just just people talking about it is good. It's, It's much better than it used to be when we first started dealing with this. People are beginning to realize it's not a choice, it's a disease, you know, and then when we first got into it, we didn't tell anybody. I mean, we didn't ask for help. We didn't know who to go to for help. You know, we just suffered ourselves together. And then when it when it became known that Will was an addict, everybody said, oh, can you help us? You know, my son's got a problem or my brother or my husband. Or, and so now it's it's like, wow, we know where to go to. We know who to call. There are people and places and organizations now so much more than there was 10 years ago. We've been relatively successful. We don't necessarily have a treatment program. We take each individual that comes in, we, we try to design a program for what their problems have been. And we, we've been really successful in taking guys that, I mean, we've had homeless people. We've had people come from prison. We've had, you know, people come from the, the rehab facilities. And they seem to respond very well to what we're offering because we're, we're not just a babysitting service. I mean, there are a lot of, halfway houses, those kind of things out there that, that are, are not much more than that. 
But we try to take them and get them a job. And the jobs that we get them in Fayette are good jobs. I mean, they all of a sudden have insurance and they have, you know, retirement plans and things they never thought they'd have before in life. The biggest thing is they're ready to go to work. You know, they've been in recovery or they've been in jail and they're ready to start being able to send that child support money back home, get um, legal issues cleared up and, and out of their out of their way so they can move forward. So there's nothing quite like uh, a resident that's with you for a few months and they get the driver's license back or they get that great job and they can send money back to their mother or to their their families. And one thing we did see was that bringing people to say it, which is very rural Alabama. They get out of our facility and bring their families to Fayette because they have a good job. So when we see those kind of success stories, it just makes you realize that it, it's been worth it. Probably the thing that's changed the most is the accessibility and the ways that you can get illegal drugs. Um, the federal government did crack down on opioid and prescriptions and that sort of thing. And as that helped, we're seeing a rise in, in older drugs like methamphetamine, cocaine, and we see it a lot in our schools through the, the source of vaping. So that's become a hot topic, vapes that are laced with fentanyl. It's just, it's everywhere and it's being laced in everything that our, a lot of our young people are experimenting with. The vaping is is huge right now amongst our students. And a lot of times they may not know what they're getting when they are buying vape or something to put in their vape, and it could be laced with fentanyl. At Restoration Springs, we have Narcan in our dormitory and our cabins as well. So we make sure that we have a good stock of that. Fortunately, we have not had to use it yet, but we're realizing that with the fentanyl use, which is much harder to um, overturn or to reverse, you're having to do, you know, five or six shots of Narcan to revive someone as opposed to when it was heroin, typically one dose of Narcan would revive them. So we are seeing positive things from that on a, a first responder side. In our city, all of our officers and first responders are, are equipped with Narcan and plenty of it. So if they run into a situation where they've got to revive someone, they're not going to rely on just having one or two doses. They've got a bag full in case this person has been using fentanyl. But I am proud of the state of Alabama for allowing FDA products and antagonists to be used when it comes to opioid and fentanyl overdoses. I think a big part that Bill and I have realized through the Wilbright Foundation is the advocacy piece. So exactly what we're doing right here, sharing our story we're noticing more awareness, more people willing to get out and share their stories like Bill and I have and not worry about what people think of you because you want to be able to make a difference and help someone else not have to live through what we have lived through. We're blessed to be able to to be in Washington, D.C. a few times a year to share it on the Hill to our lawmakers and to share the story of so many that have lost their lives to addiction and let them hear it firsthand from parents. That's very powerful. It's moving. And I, I think that it's helped move the needle some on getting some legislation passed on how we treat opioids and fentanyl. So those those type pieces of advocacy, I think, are very important and are a vital part of what the Wilbright Foundation does. We're coming into an election year and everybody's nervous, but we now know who the candidates are going to be, not that it was a big mystery before. And so um, I will continue to believe that rural America will play an outsized role. And I know your conversation on the role of rural radio and what needs to happen in terms of using that method for communication. And I don't think people really understand, you know, kind of that value um, because it is the connectivity uh, and the tissue that holds rural communities together. You know, our newspapers are dying. People are now replacing that with Facebook. But people still turn on the radio for weather. They still turn on the radio for news. And it's, a, it's definitely an opportunity to um, have a conversation about issues other than, you know, kind of the weather with uh, a broader audience in rural America. 
But I think you and your guests, Joel, both agree that it's underutilized. Isaac Wright with the Rural Voter Institute is going to join us. The, the thing to keep in mind is to go where people already go to listen. And I think that as Democrats, we've forgotten that so many times. You, you and I haven't, which is why in a, a pretty Republican state, you were able to be elected to uh, the United States Senate because you don't forget where people go to talk and to be part of that conversation. I get a chance to visit with somebody who's out there making a difference in a world that I live in every day. Uh, and that is, uh, I, you know, I'm a radio guy. I'm on a number of radio stations talking to people in the rural area. Uh, and then you see someone who's doing what Isaac Wright is doing with the Rural Voter Institute. And it makes you take a step back and say somebody else gets it. Somebody else is willing to work on it. And now I get a chance to visit with him. Isaac, good to have you on the hot dish. It's great to be here. It's best described by you. What What's the Rural Voter Institute? So we actually started right after the uh, 2016 elections. The Truman National Security Project is a national group that sort of leans into defense and diplomacy, and they were deeply involved with Secretary Clinton because she had been Secretary of the State Department, et cetera. And right after the 2016 elections, everybody took shock and said, oh, my God, what happened in rural America it was like nobody had been paying attention for the last few years. And so they came to my business partner and I, she's originally from rural South Dakota. I'm originally from rural Northwest Tennessee and said, you know, can you guys put together an autopsy of what happened in the election to give it convention? And so we did, but then we turned around and said, you know what? The autopsy has already been written. These numbers are there. We can see what happened. That story's out there. Let's turn to how we do a better job um, as people in office, as elected officials, as candidates, talking to voters in rural communities, talking with two-way communication. And so we said, you know, between the two of us, we've, we've spent God, 40 years at that point in our lives in, in campaigns and office holders' offices. And we said, you know, we'll just turn to that treasure trove of research that's out there, all the polling that's been done and focus groups. And it turned out there hadn't been in 10 or 15 years. So we turn to social science and folks who specialize in rural communities, social science, social psychology, and looked at and realized that a lot of the problems weren't values-based, they were communications-based and how we communicate values, how we do a better job of talking with people, not talking at people. And so we sort of created a thesis on how people do a better job in public policy and public office communicating with rural communities. And then it sort of took off from there and it started taking up more and more of our time. And eventually it turned into the Rural Voter Institute. And some folks said, you know, here's funding if you want to go fill that gap in research that you see is lacking. That passion came from somewhere. I mean, Isaac, it did. I mean, not giving up on rural areas where every day you got to get in your pickup, go somewhere and have somebody ticked off if you got the wrong bumper sticker on. I mean, that passion comes from somewhere. So tell me, what drives you? I mean, where'd you grow up? What do you remember? I mean, explain to people what it's like uh, to, to think what you think uh, and, and live in one of these rural areas. So I grew up in rural Northwest Tennessee. When I was growing up, it was about an hour's drive to a chain restaurant. Now they've got an Applebee's in the counties next door, which is a big deal. I remember my senior year of high school, we got the first and still the only super Walmart in the county, which meant there was something legal for us high schoolers to do past eight o'clock on a Friday night. That was a big thing. And my hometown, my home county anyway, was where Miss Pauline Gore was from. Um, that was Al Gore's mother. She was, Miss Pauline was a hometown hero. She was the first woman to graduate Vanderbilt Law School. My grandmother knew her. I wound up, my first job on a campaign was on the staff of the Gore campaign. And then I saw my home county vote against Al Gore despite his ties to our community. And it blew my mind. And I have watched that change over the years. Uh, I did Mike Beebe's Races for Governor in Arkansas. You probably remember him. He was the last Democratic governor of Arkansas and learned a lot from that. You know, he was a guy who had an agenda for the state, um, had a clear vision, and he got reelected, let's see, in 2010, which was an anti-incumbent, anti-Democrat year, if you remember. It was a rough year. Uh, and he got elected with a larger margin of any governor of either party that year on the ballot as an incumbent Southern Democrat in a red state. 
And he did so after in his first term, he passed the two largest tax increases in state history and the largest tax cut in state history, remaking the tax code to be more progressive. But he spoke to people on a values basis and about why it mattered. And he was all about making people's lives better. And so those experiences together made a big difference for me. You know, both my parents were first generation college students. I grew up with G.I. Joes and Transformers, and I know my parents sacrificed for me to have that opportunity. And there were opportunities for them because of people in public office who saw the opportunity that, that if we open the door, there are people willing with hard work to come through that door and change generations. And I was a product of that generational change. And I don't see how you come from that, how you have that experience, and you don't want to continue that opportunity for other people. So you, no different than myself, other than age, you're, you're younger and, and you're out there getting after it yet, where I'm kind of the old crippled two fake knee guy now. But, uh, you know, you're sitting there and you're saying, what can we do about it? You know, what can we do about it? How can we connect with rural voters? And, you know, you say that the autopsy had already been done. I get it. I understand it. I'm just wondering if anybody's willing to read the autopsy report. Uh, which, which basically would would tell people that they don't understand what the rural voter does, bef- you know, once they get up in the morning to go to bed at night anymore. They just don't get them. They don't understand the men and women uh, who on any given day they could be sitting next to in church. I mean, how often do you hear people in public office talk about the wage gap in rural America, Right. Rural Americans make 75 cents on the dollar compared to their metropolitan counterparts in this country. And we have all these huge problems uh, with brain drain, with upside down population pyramids, as our generation, the people my parents' age, for example, are getting older and there are less and less people to take care of them. And that's just not just like nurses and medical facilities, but that's literally their adult children to come by and check on them and those kind of things because people are leaving to find economic or educational opportunities in other places. And if we don't care for the communities that power America, those communities could wither. And and I think one of the things we've seen in our research, and we've collected data for what going on five years now uh, in Midwestern battleground states with rural and small town voters. One of the things we've seen is there is a very real, real fear that the rural way of life is under attack. And you know what? There's some truth to that. You know, there are economic threats. There are predatory threats out there that really, really pose a threat to the viability long term of our communities. You know, when I was growing up, I remember we, um, which I'll, I'll just brag for a minute, my senior class was the biggest senior class of my high school to graduate any county in county history. There were 126 of us. That's double the size of my class for the record. I, that's why I'm bragging. Yeah, exactly. So- Exactly. Yeah, it's, and not everybody made it through, but we gave it a shot, you know. <laughs> but I was around during school consolidation, right? That was part of the reason why we had such a big senior class. And at the time in our community, in the communities in our region, there was this fear that if your school was consolidated, your town would go under. That was the bedrock of your community. And what we found in our research is, you know, over 20 or 30 years, oh, I'm admitting how old I am, that hurts. That threat, that perception of threat has changed dramatically. And right now, the threat is this fear of Main Street small business. And if our Main Street small businesses go under, so will our community. And when we've talked to folks about how they define those small businesses, right, that's not just like the mom and pop hardware store, although it is that, but it's also the coffee shop. It's the guy who prepares your taxes every year. If those businesses go under, there is a real threat to the viability of the community. And that's one of the big concerns that we have to do a better job. People in public office have to do a better job of addressing. And it's not just about talking at people, right? It's about talking with people. Clearly what you're doing is trying to teach people how to connect and do the very things that you just said. But I think what you and I have in common, and a lot of people wouldn't be able to say that, is that we understand their daily life because we live it. It's, it's what and who we are. It's, and, and somewhere along the line, progressives forgot that or woke up in the morning and didn't care about it. And I don't know which one it is or if it's a little bit of both, but uh, it's still there. For 19 years, I've worked in AM radio. Granted, we're on FM, we're simulcast, and we're out there on the World Wide Web, which is great too. But 
my job was in AM radio. And if you listen to people on the coast and you hear talk to them about AM radio, they just roll their eyes and think the Ford shouldn't even have an AM radio state in it anymore. You know? Okay, best example I can give you, Isaac, and, and I'm curious what you think about this. So I'm sitting in the shop with all my buddies, right? Guys that I grew up with, hunting, fishing, you know, so we're drinking beer. This was a couple of years ago. We're sitting in this shop, and one of my friends looks at me and he says, I, ju I just can't take you anymore. I can't, you're, you're so liberal, and you just, you know, you just, I can't listen to you anymore on the radio. And I said to him, now remember, we're in his shop, you know, and I said to him, I said, well, that's your choice. You don't have to listen. I mean, there's a reason we're number one, somebody is listening. And there's a reason we're making money because somebody is listening. But since we're in your shop, let's go out back and let's turn on the combine. Let's turn on the tractor. Let's turn on the interrogator and let's find out what you were listening to when you shut them off. And he looks at me and he goes, you know, Joel... You can really be an ass sometimes. It, he was he was listening to me. He was listening because that's what they listen to. They don't always have to agree, but they're going to find something in there. They're going to find something in there that's worthy of a conversation. And somewhere along the line, people forgot how to connect with rural voters that way. He didn't necessarily like my politics, but he was willing to listen to them which means that the other people in that room drinking beer with us were sitting there going, ha, 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 he got you. Yeah, you see what I'm getting at, Isaac? Absolutely. Absolutely. I've been on a few bird hunts before when I knew the topic of politics was something that divided us. Mm -hmm. But as long as I was the one hitting the birds, nobody argued at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to put it. So how do we, how do we fix it? How do we get... My biggest problem now when I go out and recruit candidates to run is I can't win with that letter behind my name. I yeah. mean, there, there's no way I can win with that letter behind. So it, it's gone beyond winning elections to now having people not even want to run for them. Yeah, you know, Cornell did a study recently about exactly what the drop is when you put a D beside somebody's name for office. Now, this is saying, let's say that we read Joel Heitkamp's bio, right? Talk to people about it. Said, would you support Joel Heitkamp? Yes or no? Then you do the same thing, but you say Joel Heitkamp, Democrat. And what difference does that make in the drop off? And they regionalize it around the country. And I'm not going to necessarily get it exactly to the number right, but ballpark, it's about a 13 point drop in, in rural Northeast. These are strictly rural and small town voters in the regions of the country. Um, in the Southeast, it's a little more than that. And I think the biggest drops were around. 21 points in the Midwest and 23 points in the West. Think about that. Somebody that says, I agree with your values. We share the same values. I trust you. I believe in what you're going to do. And the minute you put a letter by their name, 21 point drop in support. And so one of the things we've got to do is just address the brand deficit, right? Because it's not about the values. It's not even it's even less about how we communicate than it's about the brand, although communication is a key point. But Democrats for decades stopped defining themselves in rural and small town America. And in politics, if you don't define yourself, somebody else will do it for you. And that's exactly what happened. And the problem is now when you hit certain buzzwords, when you communicate the wrong way, a brick wall goes up and nothing else you say is going to get hurt. And when we don't hear each other, that's when problems happen. That's when things break down. And so we have to do a better job of communicating. You know, you said something earlier that really triggered a thought with me, and you made a brilliant point about um, how we define ourselves. People from our communities, how we define ourselves and how it makes us define the way, the, the way we relate to the world around us. And, you know, there was actually a study about that by uh, the Journal of the Rural Education Association, where they found that adolescence, and we all go through that phase in adolescence, right, when we're trying on personalities. For me, it was, you know, I had the Hawaiian shirt on in high school and the big jeans with the bottom that you couldn't see the sneakers. And you didn't even know I was wearing the right sneakers to skateboard, which I didn't know how to ride a skateboard. And I was president of the 4-H club. But what we're doing is we're going through, we're trying on different personalities in adolescence to define our own identity. And that's part of that process. Well, what they found in the study was 
one of two things generally happens with rural adolescents in America. Either they reject the rural identity, and we all know those folks. They're people we grew up with who move away, and they say, well, you wouldn't believe where I come from. And, you know, they put onions in their red-eye gravy. That's a shout-out to my friends in North Carolina. But, you know, they make those comments and wisecracks about where they grew up, and they put it down. That's rejecting the rural identity. Or the other thing happens is what psychologists call overbinding. And they overbind to the rural identity. It becomes a fundamental part of how they define themselves, how they define the world around them, and how they define the way they relate to that world. And so when we take that for granted, when, when people in public office take for granted that a fundamental part of how you define yourself is then haunted by the fact that there is a 75 cents on the dollar wage gap because of where you live, not because of how hard you work, not because of the kind of work you do, but because of where you live, that that becomes a fundamental thing to be addressed. And when you start off in a conversation, and it just hurts my heart when I hear people walk in and say, uh, I'm here for your vote. I'm going to bring rural broadband to your community. Man, you just taught right past everything that rural broadband matters for. You just missed the boat. And we have to do a better job. People in public office have to do a better job of having that fundamental foundational conversation of the values that matter. I've got two theories that I want to float by you and, and get your take on. Uh, the first being that we're the victim of our own success. Uh, when I was growing up in North Dakota, every state executive branch uh, position that was elected was held by Democrats. Everyone. We had two uh, U.S. senators for years that were Democrats, congressmen for years. The congressmen had sagged into being the senators. It was that it was that easy to predict who is going to be the next United States senator. And, and my theory on some of this, and in my old legislative district, for you folks that haven't listened to the hot dish uh, that much, I, I served for, for 14 years in the state Senate. And I think we succeeded. And you know, you're talking about the things that we absolutely need to do now and at least acknowledge now. But I'm going to give you an example of my district. Okay. We build bobcats. We build skid steers there. Okay, so yes, it's farming based, but it's also got an industrial base, right? And so a big part of my voting block were, were union boys, union men and women who I marched the line with in the rain for three days because they were making them work Saturdays without even talking to them. Because not be, they, we didn't strike because of pay. They struck because of respect, right? So we got that fixed. We got workers' comp fixed. We got family leave fixed. Uh, we got uh, the state to acknowledge uh, uh, certain levels of pay fixed. We got all this stuff fixed. And the minute we got it fixed, they started voting Republican. And when you asked them why, they, they said the th same thing. Gods and guns. Gods and guns. And I, I went to the union meeting and I said, you guys... I mean, you didn't vote for my successor here. You, you beat him out. I was there with you. I was in that line with you. And they said, your party is just so out of touch with who we are today. I went home mad. And the next morning I woke up and I didn't know if I should have been mad at them or myself. And I'm really curious what your take on that is, Isaac. Let, let's break that into two topics. If that's okay, let's talk about God. Let's talk about guns. Um, guns first. I'm a hunter. Um, in fact, uh, I made a decision a few years ago. My kids and I, uh, the only meat we consume in the house are things that we um, harvest ourselves. Now that said, man, if I'm out on a road trip, Taco Bell is my guilty pleasure. But <laughs> when I'm at home, you know, it's venison, it's elk, it's wild turkey, um, it's it's pheasant. When I can get uh, when I can get an invitation from a friend in the Dakotas, I'm just dropping a hint there. If you want to give those it's fake knees a workout, it's let's open, do it. buddy. You come on up. But it's stuff we harvest ourselves, right? So I'm obviously, I'm a firearm owner. Um, I'm a hunter. And when we talk about guns, we, we have to face a certain reality of their different segments of gun owners having this conversation, right? There are those who are hunters who have the firearm. I have my great, great grandmother's single barrel 20 gauge that she used to shoot snakes off the front porch of the cabin. Let me tell you something. When you harvest a squirrel with that for dinner, that's a cool thing, right? 
And there are people who have those firearms because they are part of our family tradition. They've been passed down. They are part of how we put meat on the table, right? Those are folks that we can have a serious conversation with that their values often more closely align with us than anybody else. Because when I talk to my buddies who are deer hunters, you know, they don't want the guy who's a prepper, who's never hunted deer before, who's preparing for the zombie apocalypse. So he takes his AR-15 out to the deer stand and he's just going to shoot wildly because you know what? They're going to hit me or my kids, right? We're only one field over. So those folks, we need, we have a serious conversation with to be had about gun safety, about responsible gun ownership, about conservation, because you know what? My kids are eating the fish out of the water. They're eating the animals that were roaming that land. Those things matter to us. Then there's the other set of the folks who say, you know, I need 500 assault weapons because I'm preparing for when the government falls in the zombie apocalypse. We're not going to be successful in that conversation. Let's not force a round hole into a square peg. If your firearms are because you're planning to overthrow the government, yeah, we're, we're, we're not going to agree on this stuff, right? But if they're there because you're putting meat on the table because this is part of your family tradition and culture, yeah. Yeah, we have a conversation to be had. So that's that's number one. Number two on God, and this is something we've actually studied some um, at the Rural Voter Institute, and that's a serious conversation. And I'll, I'll, I'll in fact, I'll reference, I was raised Baptist, uh, and if you've ever been to Baptist Training Union, which was something I don't think they do anymore, but, but many decades ago, you know, I had a pastor in my childhood make the point, um, you, can ne- you can never argue somebody into changing their mind, but you can love them into it. And that's part of the conversation we need to have is about quit arguing with people, you know, and start being the things, practicing the things that we preach, um, live in the change, if you will. But when we talk about faith and we talk about people of faith, you know, one thing is people need to be genuine, right? If that's genuine to you to talk about your faith tradition, you know, I, I mean, a big part of my political conviction comes from Matthew chapter 25, right? When Jesus said, we will separate the sheep and the goats. We will judge believers based on how they treat the sick, the poor, the widow, the orphan, right? These are things why I believe people should have access to healthcare, right? But if it's not part of your tradition, if that's not part of who you are, don't force it. But if that faith tradition is real for you, be open and talk about, right? Respecting other people's beliefs, But people want to know what motivates you, what brings you to believe the things you believe. Because if you are putting food on the table, if you are saving because one day you hope you might get to retire or put a kid through school, then you probably don't have the chance to sit down and read the New York Times, the State Daily, the local weekly newspaper cover to cover and watch the evening news every single day to know every vote your elected representative took, right? But you know if you can turn your back and trust them while you go live your life. And that's why people want to know what our convictions are. We also found that talking in moral language, right, simply saying right and wrong is just as effective. Being able to say, you know, Democrats are often cursed with the fact they're right. And they think that if they just explain the numbers over and over logically, everybody in the world will believe them. But that's not how, it's not how we work as human beings. It's not how we make decisions. And so we have to do a better job of saying, hey, you know, my tax plan is the right idea because all the numbers work on a spreadsheet. And we have to do a better job of saying, hey, this tax plan works because the billionaires at the top who've profited the most from the American dream they had the chance to live have the bigger responsibility to put back to make sure that everybody has a chance to live that American dream than the person who's stocking our grocery shelves. They shouldn't carry that burden. Um, it's going to take a change that, you know, folks who are listening to this podcast have the opportunity to make, to demand better from those who make decisions about who goes out to talk about what topics. Yeah. Isaac, tell people where they can find the Rural Voter Institute. Tell them how they can get active, learn from it, take advantage of it. RuralVoterInstitute.org. We have five years worth of studies published there on our website. You can pull down and read. Um, We do trainings at party conventions and meetings across the country. Uh, You can write in through our website to talk about those. 
our latest report came out this week, and it's about the important role of terrestrial radio. That's AMFM radio in small town and rural America and what a cornerstone it is and how it is an important medium and how to best use the medium to communicate with people, to talk about our values, about where we stand. Isaac, I could do it all day, man. Uh, here's my word to you, okay? You get yourself an out-of-state license. You come up here mid-October, November, by noon, you will have your limit when it comes to pheasants, okay? Deal? I'm there. I'm there. I'm, right. I've been hunting South Dakota for years. I want North Dakota to push past my record. I'm in. All right. Thanks, man. Thanks for coming on the hot dish. Thank you. It's been great. The problem is, as as Democrats nationally, we don't get it or we don't care, one of the two. But it's, it's seen as this, you know, hey, nobody listens to AM radio anymore. You know what in the rural area? They listen to AM radio. And if Rush Limbaugh taught us anything, it was the fact that he can affect politics through the radio. And it worked. It absolutely worked. And if people don't acknowledge that, then they're, they're, they do so at their own peril. Yeah, and, and shows like yours give us a, a look into leading political indicators, right? You know, the, the Postal Service in North Dakota was horrific when I was in the Senate. Um, it hasn't improved much, and there's pockets of North Dakota. I, here's a great story. Well, we, it was in the middle of a, a huge um, hiring problem. I mean, lots of workforce. And so the post office thought they were going to nickel and dime it. So they basically replaced some of the old-time rural postal carriers with new postal carriers, unfortunately, those people didn't know how to deliver the mail. And my favorite story, Joel, is up in Minot, North Dakota, uh, this woman got hired to deliver the mail by some company that came in and underbid the old time rural postal carrier. And she, what she did, she was she was addicted to bingo. True story. And so <laughs> I she remember would, this yeah, story. So she would put all the mail in the first mailbox along the road. Because she knew when that woman, you know, when she went out to get her mail, she would say, oh, I've got Mildred's mail. I've got Clarence's mail. She'd drive down and deliver the mail for her. So this woman could drive back to Minot and play bingo. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that, that, I am not exaggerating. We found bags of mail in the ditch where people had just thrown the mail in the ditch. And, yeah. and, and so I, the point I want to make is when you raise some of these issues that are happening, on a show like yours where people can call in, all of a sudden you get a handle on what people are talking about, what they care about, what their fears are, what their concerns are, what their hopes are. And and I don't think I don't think there's a better medium in America, in rural America, than rural radio. And that's true actually, I want to make this point. It's very significant on reservations. Tribal radio is huge. Oh, absolutely. And, and and it's great. It, it's a wonderful way to communicate. And people can do it, you know, without folks knowing who they are. Anonymity. I mean, th that's the key, right? If, if my show, for example, they're they're mad enough to call in. They're happy enough to call in. Whatever reason they call in, uh, they can do so without everybody knowing who they are. Yeah. And and that's the beauty of it. They get a chance to, for the first time ever, not not you know, sit there and be outed for whatever belief they have. Yeah, and one thing I would say for, for the folks um, who listen to us who are curious about this, there's a number of radio stations. In fact, I'm going to give you a call signal, KFGO. When you ask Alexa um, to play KFGO, she says, KFGO, the mighty 790. It's so much fun. <laughs> but, but anyone can listen to rural radio. And I really think that political operatives across the country I ought to spend some time just dialing in and listening to what people are talking about. You don't need an expensive focus group if you can find a, 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 a talk show where people feel like they can call in and talk about what's going on. And, and the people who are talking, they're trying to convince you, Joel. They're trying to convince your, your listeners that they're right. Well, thanks so much, Joel. Enjoy your vacation. Enjoy your gum. I think it might be your first honeymoon. L last time I remember, you were too broke to take a first honeymoon, so this might be your first honeymoon. Well, we were too busy buying diapers on our first honeymoon, <laughs> you know, just getting ready for it. You know? So, yeah, there's a reason I had grandkids at a very young age. <laughs> okay, well, listen, thanks, Joel, for joining me. 
Um, and uh, I, we hope you all will tune in once again to um, The Hot Dish. It's where we go, comfort food for middle America. Please uh, continue to listen. And if you're interested in what we do at One Country, check us out at onecountryproject.com. And if you if you have suggestions or for topics or for anything else, please email us at podcast at onecountryproject.com. Topic up.